Great pleasure to welcome Chris Wigert, uh, Head of AI and Data Analytics for NTT Data, Middle East and Africa. And, you know, there's no escaping the massive uh, trend on AI and data analytics and what's, what, what's going on around it. And, of course, it's been around for a long time and uh, NTT has been uh, pushing that with data and really understanding what's happening. But generative AI is the buzzword. And, you know, I want to talk to Chris about these things. Where is NTT taking this? Because, Chris, firstly, welcome to you. I mean, business intelligence has been around for a long time. I mean, you and I have had chats about this before. And, you know, data 20 years ago was kind of AI, right? But today we've got faster computing power. We've got more power to do a lot more things and analyze that and really get real intelligence out of that data. Um, so can you, can you share some of the latest trends in data and business intelligence that are currently shaping the industry today, Chris? Yeah, okay, and uh, thank you so much. It's great to see you again. Um, my word, um, business intelligence, it feels like a lifetime ago. Um, I, I think probably the biggest changes that we've seen, Aki, and, and business intelligence was really a, a process of answering a very specific and standard question in quite a repetitive kind of way. Um, and this might sound dramatic, but AI is now promising us to almost answer any question immediately. We know it can answer any question. It's just the immediate we're still battling with. A massive, massive advancements. Um, you know, the, the concepts of data-driven decision-making has been around in talk for a long time, but now we're seeing it in practice. I mean, the, the world has moved and will continue to move. I, I expect in the next year we're going to see massive changes from a data analytics insights information perspective. That's absolutely fascinating. And Chris, I mean, you've been in the game for a long time. But mm. uh, and, 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 and just like myself, I mean, it's astonishing when you look at the pace at which it's moving mm. at. Uh, and, and I mean, you know, the predictions that people made, they said by the end of this decade, we'll get to this point in AI. But all of that is moving more and more forward. Uh, how has NTT Data Middle East and Africa leveraged these trends to yeah. enhance decision making and create business value for its clients, because at the end of the day, this is where it's going to benefit. Benefit. It's going to benefit your clients. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think okay, it's important that as NTT Data, um, we we are facing the same opportunities and obstacles and challenges as everybody else. Um, and I, I think our approach is quite unique because what we're seeing in the market is, and especially in the last six months, maybe a year, a lot of focus has gone into the concept of use cases. You know, let's pick a specific use case, let's focus on that, and let's get the ball rolling with that. Um, and although use cases are important uh, to show the value and, and to show that progression, um, one must be careful that that's not the only um, only thing that you bank on. Uh, we've seen in many cases that uh, a use case has failed and organizations almost find themselves in a position where they ask whether AI has failed now, um, for them as an organization. Now, we know that nobody can say that because we cannot say we tried, but it didn't work. So, Chris, obviously lots of experience. I know that NTT Data, Middle East and Africa, and, and you're obviously part of a, an entire global group, you guys spend a lot of money on research and development. What, what, what sets you guys apart from other players in the data and intelligence market? Because it's a, it's a crowded market, let's be honest. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and you're quite right. Um, okay, I think, you know, we've got the, the privilege and the advantage to be part of a very large organization. And with that comes a fair amount of investment uh, in R&D and, and those kind of funds we have access to as well. I think from a resource perspective, obviously a very, very large resource pool in, in AI specifically, but in general as well. Um, and, and this is not only general resources, but also very specific industry or vertical specific resources in AI. A couple to mention is perhaps manufacturing, finance, insurance, manufacturing, and, and many others. Um, I think perhaps another differentiation is also, I believe, in how to implement, because we, we see a lot of hype and we see a lot of talk, but I think a lot of people are struggling with implementation. And, and from that perspective, I think we, we've got a very solid and a well-tested process that we follow. And, and that really involves, you know, all the practical things we need to do. We need to implement, we have, have to help our, company, our customers to implement, and, and that means let's get the practical stuff out of the way. Let's get that efficiency and productivity benefits uh, in place. But then more importantly, 
this is such a fast-moving technology that we have to project, we have to look into the future and say what is going to happen next and almost work our way back uh, from there while we're doing the practical real value stuff now. So, Chris, how, how does your approach to data culture ensure that uh, all you know, your staff and decision makers are actively engaged in leveraging data for better decision making? Because it's almost like a mind shift that has to happen, right? Yeah, yeah. I think Aki, you know, and and from a implementation perspective, um, it's important that you have uh, very strong executive support and involvement in this process. You know, this this is it's moving very fast, and we almost cannot allow this gradual adoption process. It it needs to be managed in a much more active way. From a data perspective, you know, the, there's many things and there's many concerns that one needs to consider. Um, in a organization that is well structured and where access to data has been well managed, um, there's not much to do because people that have access to data have it for a very specific reason and there's authorizations in place. If I have a machine that works for me, it just works off my authorization. Uh, what is important uh, is to make sure that, uh, you know, from an access perspective, that those security and those rules are in place and that my machine does not have access to, uh, to information that it shouldn't. But that really is not an AI problem. That is a data problem. And, and, you know, that is where a lot of companies have to spend a lot of time making sure that that is in place um, at the moment. Um, I think the adoption is more from a, are we getting comfortable with this technology? And, and each one of us as individuals has a responsibility, mm. not only to our, work, our employer, but also to ourselves. Um, to remain relevant in this new world, we, we have to get comfortable. We have to spend time. We have to get our hands into this machine. Um, and each individual needs to do that. And talk to me about the role that open access has uh, when it comes to data play in, and, you know, you know, you need to foster this data driven culture within organizations. What is your approach to that open access part? Yeah, I think open access is, is really driven by uh, what is your data policies in general, um, you know, and um, uh, just from a very practical perspective, whenever we as humans generate data, the first thing we need to ask ourselves is what is the security? What is the access that people need to have to this data? Is it just for me? Is it for my organization or is it more general in nature? So it, it almost requires a change in behavior. And, and there's a new question you need to ask yourself every time that you work on data. Um, and, and then I think so individuals have got access to certain sets of data and organizations and teams have, have that similar kind of access. Um, the question that we need to ask is in order to use the machine effectively, what are those open data? Uh, that uh, that individuals and specific teams need to get access to to get full utilization and value out of these machines. Very interesting. You know, Chris, a lot of organizations are sitting on tons and tons of data, right? A, a lot of it is not clean and it's like not structured properly and, and, and that causes its own challenges. Um, talk to me about the, the, the data analytics uh, solutions that you guys provide. How do you make sure that this data and this, these analytics solutions that we talk about uh, that you provide are trustworthy and reliable for your clients? Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, on either side, if there's any kind of question mark uh, or the data is not right or there's some sort of bias, it's going to yeah. impact a lot of things around AI. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. A, a big question, Aki, because, you know, um, I, I think that the first part of answering that question is where is this data? Um, and what we need to accept is that cloud and the big hyperscalers plays a big role. And, and why that is important is your ability to scale. You know, you, you can really scale on use. Further to that, we, we're getting into a world where compute power is very important and you, you need access to GPUs. If, if I'm going to put that in my environment, that becomes an expensive exercise. So the whole data use, whether it be a hybrid solution or a, a, a very specific solution, that becomes important. Getting your data to the right place is important. Mm -hmm. um, then it gets a little bit more hazy after that because in the past, what we needed is we needed very well structured data. What we know from a gen AI perspective is the biggest power it probably has is this con contextual muscle that it has, where I can give a data and 
it can find the contextual relevance in that data. And I, I use that term very, very lightly and loosely, Aki, because that's where the danger comes in. Uh, we need to know that these machines are not going to go off the rails. They're not going to start hallucinating the, the term that, that is, is used quite a lot. Um, in my view and in our view, what, what you need to do there is you need to use the power of the same machine to make sure that uh, the output from the data ah. is correct. Um, and, and, you know, it's a bit like ethics. Um, in order to, to put an ethics guardrail on, on machines, um, you're going to need the machines to help you. It, it's just too big. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, can you, can you talk to me about the importance of uh, collaboration between different departments? Because, you know, sure. sometimes you see in organizations, they implement a massive AI solution in the IT department or whether it's in the logistics, and then they leave everybody else out. And everything, you know, every every department works with one another. You know, it's you can't have just the one side of the business uh, enabled and the customer service not enabled. Otherwise, you're not going to have a successful implementation of any kind of data project, right? Yeah, absolutely. And then, and I think, Besides for not being successful, what you might have is that the organization might miss out on something that was done in a specific department. Um, so again, this this is a matter of structure. And, and what you need to do, again, it goes back to big executive buy-in. We're seeing in the industry that there is even the, the generation and the escalation of roles like the chief AI officer that is, is now starting to sit on the exco and, and very high up in the executive. Um, but after that, and that, that becomes part of your enablement plan. Um, we cannot allow that each department or division goes up on their own and start building AI solutions. It must be a coordinated effort um, that, that is deployed right through the organization. From there, you can make sure that you, you deploy, you're deploying solutions with the necessary guardrails. You know, people are using uh, the correct tools, using the correct platforms. And without that coordination, I, I fear that six months down the line, uh, organizations will, will recognize that it has become very noisy and that the solution are all over the place and they'll probably have to reset which will cost them a lot of time yeah absolutely Chris what excites you the most about where AI and data analytics is going I mean you've got such a, a, a crucial view and you've been doing this for many years and you've never seen such change no. what are you looking forward to the most what excites you the most about these incredible changes that are coming upon us yeah, um, okay. I mean, it, it is so difficult to stay in touch with it. And, um, you know, even even for this session with you, um, if we think of what, about what has happened in the last 24 hours, um, make it two days, um, so many big, big changes, industry changes are happening almost as we speak. Just in the last 48 hours, uh, we saw Google uh, announcing um, live video, screen sharing. I can share my screen with my AI machine. I can switch my video on and show my AI machine what I'm doing. Um, last night, uh, OpenAI launched the, the same uh, functionality. Now, let's just think about that for a second. That is a big, big change because up to now, if I wanted the machine to, to have an idea of the physical world, the best I could probably do is take a picture from my phone and give it to the machine. Now, I can switch on live video. Now, this might sound quite dramatic, but... We, the machine is moving almost from perception to experience. Mm. Uh, it, it's a wow. big, 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 big change. Um, we know that uh, the whole world of agentic modeling is being talked about. It has been talked about. And it's something that we've banked a lot of investment and energy on for the last year. Um, fully autonomous agents and agencies will be very near in our future next year. They, there's already deployments of them. Uh, the impact on, on business is going to be quite dramatic. Again, from a... a uh, efficiency, productivity perspective, but also, you know, all of a sudden we are able to, to, to really escalate and speed up the innovation cycle. In the past, if you think about innovation in the past, and especially mm -hmm. when we want to build technology innovations in a business, it was quite a long process. You, you had to convince somebody, you had to get funding, you had to get a team together. That, that has all been short-circuited, where you can almost build very quick prototypes. So I think from an innovation perspective, uh, the world is going to look a lot different in, in 12 months' time. Chris, it's always great chatting to you and getting your insights. Chris Wiggett, who's the head of AI and data analytics for Entity Data Middle East and Africa. Chris, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Aki. All the best.